I want to thank you all for listening again, if you even are listening. As I said last week, I'm doing this more for myself than I am for anybody else. Uh, my relationship with God through Jesus Christ is the most important relationship that I have. I don't always do it perfectly. I'll, I'll be upfront with you. Uh, but I know I need a discipline, and this is that discipline for me. Of, for, you know, well over 30 years, I had to prepare a message every week. And I don't want to get out of that rhythm because somehow in the midst of me getting into the scriptures and me sort of having to eat, drink, sleep, and walk with them every day, uh, it helps me. So I hope today it comes to you, even though probably the photography's not perfect and everything's not right, I hope that somehow the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this day. I thank you for being with us, for being in us. I think so many times we just think that you kind of are there when we call upon you, but not there other times. And the reality is, is you're more with us than we're with ourselves. So this day, help us to be with you and help us to be with ourselves. Because when the two of us are together, incredible things happen in our life. There's a sense of trust, a sense of confidence, a sense of just knowing. And that's what we strive for today. That's what I strive for. Be with us now as we open the scripture in the name of your son. Amen. The reading for today is the Old Testament reading for the second Sunday of Lent. It comes to us from Genesis chapter 15. It reads like this. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring. And so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look towards the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought them all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The word of the Lord. You know, it's interesting. As I was uh, preparing this week for this, uh, I saw a news article that kind of took me by surprise. It was actually a report about a teacher. She was a media specialist. Her name was Anna, and she worked at Trinity Episcopal School, someplace I think out in California, I'm not sure. But she was talking about this house that she bought. She was a single woman. She had a dog, which, you know, me and dogs, I love dogs. And she said she'd fallen in love with this house so much that she almost counted the house sort of like another family member or a friend. I mean, it was that close to her. She loved it. But as she had entered into cleaning the house a little bit deeper, she was up in the attic and she found a room that wasn't really hidden, but she didn't realize was even in the house. It wasn't, didn't have a door handle on it. It just had a latch where there was a sort of an opening piece of plywood that she could go in. When she went inside, 
lo and behold, what she found was treasures. It wasn't gold or silver or diamonds. It was boxes of old letters. Old letters that were written back in the 1950s. It was between two people. A man by the name of Vance, who was obviously in the military, and to a woman that he obviously was smitten with. The woman must have kept all those letters all those years. Her name was Betty Sue, his name was Vance. And it said things like, you know, when I'm around you, I don't even know what to say except I love you, but when I'm away, I have so many things I want to tell you. I just want to be with you. I, I love you so much. Well, she was sort of engrossed in all these letters. I mean, there was, there was hundreds of them. And she felt like this was a treasure she couldn't keep. And so she used her skills in media and put it out on Facebook and on some of the other media things. And lo and behold, she found out that these were letters written between a husband and a wife, but not at that point, but two people that ended up getting married and were married for over 50 years. She ended up meeting and encountering the grandson of these two people. It was funny because what she said in there was, you know, here was the way that we used to communicate. Everything was in cursive, perfect punctuation, the whole nine yards. And it was about relationship. You know, it made me think about relationship. You know, I mean, in this day and age, we have information and communication with all the different kinds of ways we can talk on the phone, we can text, we can email, we can do Instagram, we can do Facebook, you name it, we got it. But I wonder how many relationships are really relationships in that full sense where you have to put energy into it, where you actually stop and think how it's written, reread it, proofread it, send it back, and then we hold on to it. I don't know about you, but most of the emails and texts I get, unless somehow I hit the wrong button and it goes to the cloud, I just delete them. And yet here was a time when a young man and a young woman who went on to being married for over 50 years really poured out their hearts in words. It made me look at my relationship with God, which is to me the primary relationship that uh, we were all created for relationship with God and I started to think to myself what does that relationship with God mean I looked into the scriptures for this week and the Old Testament lesson was the one that I fell upon it's the exact start of where the understanding theologically of the Christian understanding of relationship with God comes it doesn't say relationship let me make it clear and the Old Testament never says you have a relationship with God. It always usually says, and it was counted upon him as righteousness. But that's the same thing. In other words, you were right with God. You walked with God. Even though you didn't walk perfectly. In the story that we have today, we have the story of Abram. He has not yet become Abraham. He's still Abram. He's the one that left Ur of the Chaldeans and was taken off to the Promised Land. He and his wife, Sarai, who later becomes Sarah. There's a lot of encounters that they have. Encounters where they go to Egypt. And to be honest with you, Abram is scared because Sarah is so beautiful. He thinks that his wife is going to be thought of as a sister or, or thought of as his wife. And he's going to be killed. So he pretends he's her sister. And, you know, uh, all kinds of things happen differently. It's a story that comes after where Lot has gone off, you know, and and has to escape. It comes to a place where all of a sudden, here Abram is probably at least 90 years old, and the only child he has is Eliezer from Hagar, his wife's handmaiden. And he thinks that that's going to be his heritage, and he's got to have a son because that's the way you had to have offspring and especially a son. And he didn't have it, Sarah was barren. He comes and he speaks to God and the word of the Lord comes to him and, and, and the Lord says, look at the stars of the sky, I'm gonna make your descendants." He goes, I don't have an offspring, I don't have an heir, except Eliezer. 
and he's not even my own. And the Lord says, no, you're going to have one from your own issue. He goes, how can that be? And then all of a sudden, he comes in and he says, and I'm going to make, you know, you possess land. Once again, Abram, how can that be? How can I know? How can I know? You know, as I read that, I thought to myself so many times, I want to believe God, but some of the things that I feel like he tells me, promises me, even with peace or, or love or, or things like that, I think, well, how am I going to know that I'll get it? How do I know it's going to turn out the way it's supposed to? Abram's not unlike me. He's not unlike you. Abram says, how can this be? It's interesting how God responds to him. Because when it says that God responds to him and says, I want you to take a sacrifice, three-year-old goat, three-year-old lamb, a bunch of animals and a turtle dove and a pigeon, I think. And he says, I'm going to have you sacrifice him. He does it in a certain way that's very ritualistic. He shoves away the birds of prey that come down and see it because they want a meal. He shoves them away. But then in the midst of the night, in the darkest type of the night, what happens? All of a sudden, a flaming oven and a torch come through. I said that wrong. It's a smoking oven and a flaming torch come through. And that's enough. You know, I wonder why, why was that? And I, I looked at all kinds of different commentaries and things and, you know, what does a, a smoking pot or a smoking oven and a torch have to do with it? And everybody, you know, had illustrations to Christ and to all that, and they may be right. But the thing that struck me in this was that I think more than anything else what God was trying to get across to him was he was saying you just got to trust me you got to believe me you got to believe that I'm going to be with you you're going to have offspring you're going to have land to possess it's not the question of how it's rather a question do you trust me for me to lead you into it and when I thought about the smoking pot smoking oven and the torch, immediately my mind went back and I thought about the Exodus when Moses leads the people of Israel, now a nation, into the desert for 40 years. What leads them through the desert? Do you remember? Cloud by day, fire by night. In a miniature sized way, that smoking Pot, that smoking oven is a cloud and in a miniature way fire by night is a flaming torch maybe what God was doing in the scripture was to say I'm gonna lead you the way I'm gonna lead my people hundreds of years later are gonna be led out of bondage in Egypt maybe God's been talking to us the same way all these years but we're uh, little variations take place <laughs> if we can go from writing letters in cursive with perfect punctuation to emails and texts and so on why can't God change it up a little bit you see the whole reason I believe that this took place was because God wants us to have a relationship with us and it's not our worthiness that makes us have a relationship with us it's Really, God's grace that makes us worthy. That God picks you and picks me just to love us. That somehow in the deep part of your soul, that if you take your time and you'll just be quiet for a second, you'll know that God is saying to you, listen, I love you and you know I'm going to lead you. It might look like smoke, it might look like cloud, it may look like fire, it may look like difficult times, it's going to probably be dark, but I'm going to lead you and I'm going to be with you in almost anything that you ever could possibly imagine and beyond. You see, that's the God that we have. But it's a God who wants us to have a relationship with him. And I thought about that too. And I thought to myself, I wonder how many times in my life I've really, well been in that full relationship with him. I came to the conclusion 
a lot of my life, sometimes I was having an affair with God more than having a relationship with him. I mean, I wanted what I wanted out of him. I wanted to have him give me and tell me it's okay and the whole nine yards. But it's more important to be with him than to get what you want from him. And when you are with him, then you get what you need from him. And he leads you to what is best for you. Are you having a relationship with God? Or are you having an affair with God? You're the only one that can tell that. You've just performed to get him? Or, or do you respond to the grace that's been given to you. I mean, relationship starts hard. So, I mean, in the past, I've asked and said to people, you know, where is your relationship? Have you just met? Are you dating? Are you engaged? Are you married? Have you met but broke up? I mean, where are you with God? Because it's a relationship that he wants, not an affair with you. You know, it reminds me of a story that I've told many times that some of you probably have heard took place years and years ago in the early 80s when I first moved I lived in an apartment actually in Pine Hills of which they call Crime Hills Orlando I was going through a really difficult time in my life I worked for Rinker Materials I was doing ministry on the side and I'll never forget when uh, all of a sudden I, a decision had to be made it was a difficult decision. It was a decision, though, that would change the course of my life, depending on which way I went with it. I kept on praying, God, lead me, God, lead me, God, lead me. What I wanted was him to fix the situation. Because I just really kind of at that point probably wanted less of a relationship and more of an affair. As I prayed one Sunday morning, after I decided going to church was going to be worthless for me, that I might as well stay home and just try and talk to God because I wasn't hearing him at church. I started to pray, and it was getting closer and closer to the point where a decision had to be made or was going to be made for me, and I was not excited about that idea. I started screaming at God. I mean, why aren't you answering me? Why aren't you talking to me? Why, why is it that you're just letting this go on? i got to have a decision. Will you act? Will you just act? In the midst of me yelling, all of a sudden I heard God say to me really clearly, why do you treat me like Santa Claus? I'm your father. That cut right into my soul. I began to weep, to be real honest with you, in that apartment by myself. I said, I just need you, Father. I just need you to be with me. The moment I said that, a peace that I still taste, I still smell, I still feel, came over me. I knew that God was with me. And I knew that if I was with the Father, no matter what direction the decisions went, I was going to be okay. It didn't matter what direction it took. What mattered was who I was with. I really believe at that point I went from just wanting an affair with God to going into a deeper relationship with God. It's funny because within five minutes of that, the phone rang. And it was a decision that had been made. And it was a decision I wanted. That was even better. But really, the whole lesson that I went through was just knowing that God was with me. I wasn't by myself. And that peace was always going to be there. God would always show himself to me if I took the time to look, to wait, to see. As you go through your week this week, I pray that you know that, you know what? He might come to you as a smoking pot. He might come to you as a cloud. He might come to you as a flaming torch. 
He might come to you as a flame at night. He may come to you and speak to you on the beach. He may come to you and speak to you in an apartment. He may come to you in many ways, but he is always coming to you because he desires you and he desires that relationship with you. And he will never, ever give up pursuing you because he loves you that much. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.